Shalom, shalom, family, most high in Christ. Bless everybody. Happy Monday, y'all. Got another Monday, y'all, to get it right. All praise to the most high God, everyone. Shalom, shalom to all the people who just coming in. Come on in, y'all. Let's get in these scripts. Shalom, sis. Most high in Christ, bless y'all. get started at 710 y'all we can get started in about seven minutes y'all seven minutes gonna get started y'all Shalom, shalom, family, most high in Christ, bless y'all. We're going to get started in about four more minutes, y'all. Four more minutes, y'all.
All right, it's 707. This song get me too high. I'm about to start jumping around and stuff. All right, brothers, uncover your heads. Sisters, cover up your heads. We about to go ahead and sit face to east and send up the prayers. Once again, shalom, everybody. Most high Christ bless. Let's go ahead and face to east and send up the prayers, y'all. Dear Heavenly Father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we come to you humbly and thank you today, God, for giving us another day to repent and showing so much grace and mercy to us, God, that we do not even deserve. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you thank you, Jesus, for just continuing on protecting us, putting your hands over us, God, as our oppressors constantly oppress us and keep us at the bottom of society, God. But dear Lord, thank you, God, for sending your son, Jesus the Christ, God, to redeem the so-called blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, the 12 tribes of Israel, God. Thank you, Jesus, so very much for just being there for us, God, and showing us so much grace and mercy, God. And thank you, Jesus, for watching over all of us, sisters throughout the body, and watching over all of us who are pregnant, and watching over all the men who are going out and teaching your word, God, as thus saith the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Jesus, once again for everything you've done for us, and redeeming us fairly and swiftly, God, and uh, bringing destruction to this planet, God, to this battle on the great, and destruction to our enemies, God. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hey, I was going to get started in like one minute. <laughs> I was about to get started at 17, but hey, I was like, nah, this song getting me too high. I'm about to start bouncing around and jumping and stuff. I ain't need to be doing all that. But hey, all praise to the most high God. Hey, happy Monday, everybody. I hope and pray everybody's doing well this morning. So the title of today's class is From Dung to Lively Stones. The rebuilding of a nation, all right? From dung to lively stones, the rebuilding of a nation. Because we as a people, we need to be rebuilt. We need to be redeemed. We need to be rebuilt. We need to be reconstructed <laughs> as a nation of people. And I'm going to go off. I'm going to go on a tangent real quick. Just a short tangent. So I was watching this movie called Flight the other night on, um, on Netflix, I believe. And it's about Denzel Washington. And what he is, he's a, a pilot. He's a well-renowned pilot that's well-known, you know what I'm saying, for going place to place to place, whatever, flying the airplanes, right? And I see Denzel Washington as on this particular movie. I forgot what his name was. But on this particular movie, he's a great representation of what Israel is. This man had all the opportunity to continue on being a great pilot, you know what I'm saying, continue on making all this money, doing, um, doing the work, right? But he kept on falling into uh, being an alcoholic. He had a chance to go to rehab. He had a chance to, um, um, he had multiple chances over and over again to pretty much repent, repent from his particular sin, which was alcohol, right? And... The reason why I correlate with him with Israel is because the Lord is constantly giving us chances after chances to get it right. But at the end, he ended up having to go to jail to get it right. He ended up having to, to go into prison to get it right, just like us today. So we have to learn what our vices are, what our vices are or what sins that we deal with. You know, it might not be alcohol. It might be you deal with a lying spirit. You deal with a whoremongering spirit. You deal with a covetous spirit. You deal with unclean spirits. You deal with a vainglory spirit. You might have a spirit where um, you want to get promoted or whatever the case may be. But you have to learn to fight it, all right? Have to learn how to fight it to become lively stones. Become lively stones. That's the title of the class, all right? So first and foremost, let's go ahead and get into the scriptures. Uh, Romans, the seventh chapter. In the eighth verse, this is every last one of us. Paul, like Paul, like I was giving an example about Denzel Washington in the movie Flight. Paul's going to give his own experiences of how he deals with certain things. All right. Excuse me. Romans 7 and verse 8. It says, but sin, taken occasion by the commandments, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. All right, so it might be kind of hard for some people to kind of understand. So I'll break it down piece by piece. So it says, but sin, which is breaking the commandments, right? Taking occasion by the commandments, meaning it, over, it clouded his mind sometimes. It clouded the thoughts of keeping the commandments. 
Because we know the scripture says, if you lust upon a woman, you've already committed adultery. What Paul is saying right here is, hey, sometimes the commandments left the dough. Sometimes I couldn't think about the commandments. Sometimes on occasion, sin consumed my mind. And that's what we all have to realize, like, dang, like, sin, like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm drowning. I'm drowning or sin is constantly plaguing my mind. So we got to learn how to fight. Right. And it says occasion, the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. So now Paul is saying, hey, what are you dealing with? Strong sexual desires. That's what concupiscence is. Strong sexual desires. So Paul is saying on occasion, hey, these thoughts plague my mind. But what Paul do, though, Paul recognized that he checked it. Like the Bible, what he's saying is the Bible says for without the law, sin was dead. Meaning if he didn't know the laws of God, he will still be that dung. That's why it's so important. We have to study the scriptures because it says for without the law, sin was dead. A lot of people are dead on the street right now. The, uh, the congregation of the dead, walking zombies, continue on selling dope to our people. They continue on selling crack to our people. They continue on prostituting our people out in these streets. Because why? The laws of God are in their minds. But when the laws of God are in your mind, it identifies certain particular things that we deal with and that we have to fight. All right? So, uh, from there, from there, from there, let's go into the live of the stone. I just pulled that scripture to show y'all. Hey, every last one of us, 85 one of us, on the, or 86 one of us on this uh, Facebook platform is dealing with some form of sin. But we have to be able to study the scriptures to identify what sins we deal with so we know how to overcome it. All right. Uh, first, uh, let me see. First Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter two, because maybe not everybody knows what a lively stone is, according to the scriptures. So let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. It's the book of first Peter chapter two and verse five. He also. As lively stones are build up a spiritual house. That's what we're doing today. Like during the time of Nehemiah and Ezra, how they was building up the temple again. They was building it up. Now we're building up their righteous temple by the 12 tribes of Israel coming together under one nation. Under one, under one platform, which is this Bible. Coming together under one rock, which is Christ. It says, ye also as lively stones. Are built up a spiritual house and the holy priests to offer up spiritual sacrifices. We're offering up the spiritual sacrifices now. And what is those spiritual sacrifices? Us keeping the Sabbath day holy. Us wearing fringes, wearing a beard. Our men, our women acting according to what God tells us to do. Women walking upright and serving their lords. Men actually going out here and taking care of their wives and their kids. Men putting down the dope. Men putting down the bottle, men putting down the pornography, sisters closing their mouth when it's when it's meant to, for them for them to be solid. That's what the spiritual sacrifices is. It's these commandments, us coming back to the laws of God, and it says to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. All these things are acceptable unto God because why the Lord gave it to us, and it's only it's, it's for us. And by us, <laughs> by us, for us, it's only written for us. So why, what more is it for us not to apply to be those lively stones and not be that dumb? Matter of fact, I'm going to give a definition. I probably should have gave a definition before I read the scripture, but it is what it is. We're we rocking and rolling right now. It says uh, the definition of lively, right? It says briskly alert, energetic. Animated, a lively uh, discussion, lively children racing from home, active. I like that one word, active. We have to be active in this truth. We have to be moving and grooving in this truth, y'all. We just can't be sitting around just watching the clock go by. No, we got to get out here in these streets. Our sisters got to repent. Our brothers got to repent. We have to get out here and do the work of the Lord if we want to be those lively stones. But on the flip side, on the flip side, it's the dumb. It's the dumb. Um, Sirach 20, 22 and 1. The book of Sirach. Chapter 22 and verse 1. It 
It says a slothful man is compared to a filthy stone and everyone will hiss at him out to his disgrace. Now, to correlate this with the class, it says a slothful man is compared to a filthy stone. A filthy stone is dumb. It's doo-doo. <laughs> the same thing, the brown thing that goes down the toilet. That's what this Bible is saying that our people are compared to. Because why? Yeah, it's going, like I said, it's going to a slothful man. But we as a nation of people are a slothful people. If we choose not to keep the commandments, if we choose not to repent, we are that slothful people. We are that dumb people. All because why? We are not getting up off our tail, off our ass and making stuff happen. Making moves. Making moves to make uh, to bring back this kingdom, to bring forth this kingdom. To bring forth the righteous Christ to come back and save his people. We got to get up off our tail, y'all, and make, uh, make moves, y'all. We got to make moves. We got to make moves. We got to make moves. And it says, uh, verse 2, it says, A slothful man is compared to the filth of a dunghill. Every man that taketh it up will shake his hand. You think about us today as a nation of people. If you read up in verse one, it says, and everyone will hiss him, uh, hiss him out to his disgrace. I mean, nobody, nobody want to deal with a, a dunghill. Nobody want to deal with a slothful person. That's what they look at us today as a nation of people. They look at they call us lazy. Uh, they say we don't want to do nothing. We don't want to work. We always got to get handouts, the Section 8, the EBTs. Um, what's some other things they give us? Section 8 EBTs, um, the worst ghettos, the worst projects. They hiss at us as a nation of people. All these other nations just look down upon us. Because while as a nation of people right now, we are that dumb. And that's why I said before, we're building ourselves up to become lively stones. All right. And another scripture about that as well, too. Uh, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel the 37th chapter. Ezekiel the 37th chapter. Hey, before I go there, before I go there, I'm going to show y'all how low of a people we are. You know, they say you are what you eat, right? You are what you eat. Hey, and hey, shout out to Bishop Kana. Bishop Kana brought this out the other day. Um, I'm just correlating this scripture with what he brought out. So he brought out about how... Um, how we eat dung today. <laughs> we eat dung today, y'all. That was baffling to me. If y'all seen that class, I was like, oh, snap. I'm like, man, these people are evil and wicked as hell. But not realizing, I'm reading it, thinking about Ezekiel had to do it. But we're doing it today. We're doing it today because why? As a nation of people, we are that dung. We are that dung today because there's no, there's no liveliness in us. There's no commandments in us. Because the commandments what makes us live. A dung is something that's just dead and doo-doo. <laughs> but hey, like I was saying, this could not brought it out the other day how they have certain percentages of how much dung can go inside of your food. If you have, like I said, if you haven't watched the last Sabbath class, you need to check it out. You need to check it out. All right. So Ezekiel, the fourth chapter and the 12th verse. Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 12. And it says, and thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. So what the Lord is telling Ezekiel is you're going to have to eat man's dung. You're going to have to eat man's dung because you're going to be put in such a low estate. You're going to be trying to gripple and grapple for whatever you can eat. As today, as bringing it up to today's time, we as a nation of people, we don't, we don't harvest our own food. We're not um, hurtling cows. We're not uh, raising up quails as a nation of people. You might see people here and they're doing it. But as a nation of people, we're not doing these things. We don't have tomatoes and um, tomatoes and peppers growing out the ground. No, we got to go to Walmart for those things. We got to go to um, Target, Whole Foods, Kroger's, wherever grocery store you get your groceries from. We got to go to Burger King for our food. You know how to file that food is? What, what the Lord is telling Ezekiel right now, you're going to have to eat the worst of the worst. <laughs> and that's what we're doing today. You think about all the GMOs that they put inside the plants. You think about all the steroids they inject inside of our chickens. You think about all the steroids they inject inside the cows. The Lord said, hey, at this one point in time, and as a nation of people, y'all going to be a lower state to where y'all eating the worst food ever. 
That's why we eating dumb today. <laughs> hey, I'm going to read that again. I'm going to read that again. Uh, verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 12. And it says, And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. And the Lord said, Even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whether I will drive them. Meaning wherever we go, we're going to eat the foul breads. Wherever we go, we're going to be eating the foul cows, chickens, um, hens, whatever thing you can eat, it's going to be the foul. That's why hey, I keep bringing it up because it keep popping in my mind. But uh, verse 14, then said I, I, Lord God, behold, my soul have not been polluted for, uh, for from my youth up. Even to now, I have not eaten of that which dieth of itself, or is torn in pieces. Neither came there a bumble flesh into my mouth. Then he said unto me, Lo, I have given thee cow dung for man's dung, and thou shalt prepare thy bread with thee, uh, therewith. So the Lord said, hey, if you don't want to eat man's dung, eat that cow dung. Can y'all imagine eating cow dung? But lo and behold, every time you go to Whop, uh, Burger King, you get that fat Whopper. <laughs> you get that uh, that's, uh, double stack Whopper. <laughs> you eating dung. <laughs> every time you go to Sam's Club, you get that big tomahawk steak that you just want to throw on a grill. You know what I'm saying? Put all the charcoal, light that thing up and put it on the grill. Let it sizzle for a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Make sure it's well done. You eating dung. <laughs> There's little specks of dung inside of that meat. Whenever you go... Um, Go get, uh, even for you vegans, even for you vegans, you want to eat the tomatoes and uh, the corn and all that stuff, they injecting it with dung. <laughs> hey, and it's just showing y'all the lowest state of people we are today, where God says, hey, even y'all up to 2023, y'all going to be eating dung. Because why? Y'all chose not to be those lively stones. You chose not to do what I told you to do. So since you didn't choose to do what I tell you to do, you're going to be eating the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> you're going to be eating what's under the barrel. <laughs> All right. Uh, Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. One of my favorite uh, scriptures. Ezekiel chapter 37. All right. It's the book of Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 1. Then the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. And set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. Hey, this goes right back into not being those lively stones. <laughs> hey, these bones are dead. Can you imagine the bones are dry? Matter of fact, it's gonna tell us. Let me let me go ahead and keep reading the scripture. And it says, And caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many of in the open valley, and lo. They were very dry. So you imagine seeing thousands upon thousands, maybe even millions of stones or millions of bones just laying down. Just laying down. Matter of fact, I think about, um, I tell you, I correlate a lot of stuff with the movies, right? With movies. It was one particular Terminator movie where I think he was looking into the future. That's where they get this stuff from, y'all. They get these passages. They get these movies from the Bible. There's one particular movie scene in Terminator where... They got the, the camera just pedaling all through this valley and there's nothing but dead bones, dead bodies. Here it is. You got a, a, you got a hip bone. You got a skeleton somewhere. You got ribs laying all over the place. You got back bones laying all over the place. You got a uh, shin uh, uh, with the calf muscle or calf legs laying everywhere. You got all forms of the body bones, dead bones laying everywhere and it's just piled up. It's just piled up everywhere. And verse 3 says, and he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, oh, Lord God, thou knowest. Hey, Lord, only you know if these people can repent. With these dry bones, we see it today. Like, matter of fact, in Memphis, Tennessee, when we go out on Bill Street, hey, it's all forms of wickedness going on every single place on Bill Street. We see women have whole, pretty much naked, butt ass naked, walking around the street. We see men smoking weed. We see men fighting. We see men out there about to kill each other. Matter of fact, I got a story about that. 
There was a fight that broke out when we went to camp the other night. You know they use horses to break up fights now? I never knew that. I never knew why they had those horses. You know, it never dawned on me. I never just thought about, like, why, why, why are the police on horses, right? Why are the police on horses down on Bill Street? But lo and behold, what they do is, whenever Jake start fighting, start want to get crunk, start want to buck the system, they use them horses to start bucking. <laughs> you want to buck the system? All right, you ain't going to buck harder than this horse. You got the horses breaking up the fight. And if you still continue on trying to fight, they start using their hugs and start beating, hey, start stomping on folks. All oh, because why? It's the dry bones in the streets. Because of sin everywhere. The Lord says, hey, since you're not going to listen to me, I'm going to put an oppressor above you that you're going to most definitely going to listen to. And I bet, I guarantee you, them females that was fighting that night, they was feeling every little, um, every little, um, <laughs> horseshoe. That was kicking their tail when they was on the ground. I'm talking about the horse was just stomping on them. Stomping on them because why? They had the hatred in their heart so much for their neighbor that Esau had to break it up. Esau had to break it up. All right, let me get back to the scriptures, y'all. All right, verse three again. And it says, and he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. And again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of God of the Lord. That's what we do every Saturday. That's what we do at 365. What other can all praise to the most high God? All praise to the most high God for Israel and Christ. But what other camp do you see doing the worst we doing? We teaching three times a day, seven days a week. We out here on the streets every single day, y'all, preaching to these dry bones. Like, hey, repent, brother. Take out the dang dress and put on pants according to what God says. Hey, sister, take out them damn pants and put on a dress. Hey, brother, stop hating your neighbor. Stop hating your neighbor that you don't even own blocks for. Stop selling drugs to our people. Hey, bro, start celebrating the Sabbath day and get out the Sunday wicked church. Stop celebrating Easter Thanksgiving. That's what we doing out here today. We're doing exactly what the Lord ordained Ezekiel to do. Because why? We are our forefathers, y'all. Whether y'all know it or not, hey, we are those people of the Bible. <laughs> we are the people. We are those Ezekiels. We are those Jeremiah's. We are those King Davids. We are those Peters, the Pauls, the James. We are the ones going out teaching our people because thus saith the Lord. All right? Um, let me see here. Verse 5. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall uh, shall live, and ye shall live. So the breath, as a matter of fact, what is the breath? Wisdom of Solomon chapter 7 and verse 24. Wisdom of Solomon, because I can tell you what the breath is, but I can show you better than I can tell you though. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 7 and verse 24. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 7 verse 24. And it says, from wisdom is more moving than any motion. She passed and goeth through all things by the reason of pureness. Verse 5, for she is the breath of the power of God. This Bible is the power of God. The Bible is the breath. The Bible is what conforms us and converts us from being a nigger to a, a, a Israelite. You know what I'm saying? From the 12 tribes. <laughs> hey, hey, the breath is what converts an African American into the tribe of Judah. <laughs> hey, the Bible, the breath of, of the Bible is what converts so-called Mexican into the tribe of Issachar. <laughs> the Bible is what converts a so-called West Indian or Jamaican into the tribe of Benjamin. The Bible is what converts us from niggas into being kings and gods on this earth. This is the breath right here, y'all. This is the breath. And we got to be able to breathe that breath. But the breath is what constantly going to reform our minds into what gods and kings and princesses have to do. I'm going to finish that verse and I'm going to jump back to Ezekiel 37. It says, for she is the breath of the power of God and a pure influence flowing from the glory of the almighty. Therefore, can no defiled thing fall into her. All right. So we learned what the breath is. The breath is the commandments. The breath is the Bible of God. All right. Verse six, and it says, I will lay sewers upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin 
and put breath in you. So I meaning it's constantly rising. The water is constantly rising. The water is constantly. I remember, I think it was back in 2007, 2016. I cannot remember what year it was. But I remember when the new moon doctrine had came out. When I understand when the water had risen with the new moon. I was like, man, that makes so much sense. A light that decre uh, decreases in her perfection. I'm like, wow. As we continue to grow, y'all, as we continue on prophesying unto the streets, unto these dry bones, the water's going to continue on rising. And you're going to see how people start becoming more lively. You're going to see how people convert from saggy pants to wearing uh, <laughs> jeans that fit them perfectly fine and, ha and not sagging and wearing fringes. Men not shaving their beards no more, and not uh, men not shaving their beards anymore. The Michael Jordan look is over with. It's done. The Charles Barkleys or the Shaquille O'Neal, we love our brothers. We love our brothers. We pray they repent. But those styles got to be done away with. We got to start rocking the, uh, the fros, the beards. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You look at a lion. Look how 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 manly it looks. You know when it has a beard, when it has its mane. <laughs> hey, we converting boys into men over here, y'all. And that's that lively stone. That's when the skin is talking about the skin, the skin, the breath. As it continues on growing and growing, you see a body starting to conform. You starting, to, you see, it's starting to see a body now starting to become structured. Now you see, a, you got a skeleton. You got a, a full body skeleton. Just to give y'all a visual, the bones are everywhere, but now those bones are starting to come together. They're starting to come together. And now, uh, what was that called? Uh, anatomy? I think it's called anatomy. <laughs> Where you got the body, the study of the body, right? So now you got the bones. Then you're going to start getting the skin. You're going to start getting the veins. You're going to start getting the heart. You're going to start, everything's going to start to construct itself into a full, full fledged body. All right. Uh, I'm going to stop and I'm going to go all the way to verse, uh, I'm going to go all the way to verse eight. So I'm in verse seven now. It says, so I prophesied. As I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, shaking, the bones came together, bone to his bone. So here it is. Uh, I remember Bishop Nathaniel brought up one time. He was singing a song, uh, hip bone connected to the backbone, the backbone connected to the, I don't know, <laughs> the rib bone, I don't know. <coughs> but hey, as these bones, as we continue to prophesy, these bones are going to continue on coming together. All right, verse eight. And when I beheld, lo, the sewer and the flesh came up upon them and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. So man, it's continue on coming together, continue on coming together. All right, all right. Uh, let me see, let me see, let me see here. From there, let me see here. From there, uh, Proverbs, Proverbs 21 and verse 25. Because remember earlier, we brought out the scripture in Sirach 22 and 1. It talks about uh, a dung being someone who's lazy, someone who's not keeping the commandments, right? You know, somebody who's just sitting there and just watching, watching the clock go by, watching the grass go, right? Uh, Proverbs 21 and verse 25. It says, the desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hand refuses to labor. Hey, meaning you're going to be getting put to death. Because <laughs> why are you not doing what the Lord tells you to do? Like, we can't have a slothful spirit in this truth. We got to labor in pain. We got to labor in pain to keep the unity amongst us together. We got to labor in pain to keep our marriages going strong. If you just slothful, you just put your hands up and just be like, hey, I'm going to go out here and commit adultery on my wife. You just put your hands up and say, hey, I'm going to curse my husband out and call him a ban. You put your hands up and say, hey, I'm, what I'm going to do is, I don't want to raise these kids. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to be a slothful mom and go ahead and just um, put my child in the car and then go to some neighborhood and just ring the doorbell and just sit my child there and just run away as fast as I can. That's what slothful people do. That's what an uh, un unbelieving person do. That's someone who don't have the fear of the Lord in them do. And that's why we are that dumb people today. <laughs> We are that dung people today because we choose not to do what the Lord tells us to do. We choose to be slothful. That's why you see dope dealers out in the streets today. As opposed to getting a nine to five and working your way up into corporate America or whatever, whatever job you may want. You choose to be in sin. You choose to poison our community. Because why? You just want to get that almighty dollar. Is that almighty dollar worth you killing your brother? Is that almighty dollar worth you selling your body? 
Is that almighty dollar worth you uh, putting dope inside of yourself? That's what we have to ask ourselves. People are like, what is that almighty dollar worth? Is it worth destroying your people? I got to ask ourselves that. Uh, let me see here. Let me see here. Let me see here. Um, okay, okay, okay. So, a part of becoming lively stone, we have to learn how to deal with each other, right? We have to learn how to deal. We have to learn how to deal. Hey, y'all, so a lot of y'all who watch my class classes know I love going to Samuels. Sam, first, first and second Samuels is Israel for real, for real, all right? Uh, first Samuel, or second Samuel, sorry, uh, 11. 11, we're going to do a little reading here. We're going to do a little reading here. We're going to do a little reading here. I think it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. First, or second Samuel chapter 11. Make sure I'm at the right point. We're probably going to read about the whole chapter, y'all. I ain't going to lie to you, but I'll try to break it down bit by bit. All right? All right, so second Samuel chapter 11 in verse 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbi. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. So we had times we took breaks from fighting, y'all. <laughs> we took breaks from fighting at one particular time where it says in the beginning, the year was expired. So, hey, now it's time for them to go back to war. David's like, hey, we about to go kick some Amos butt again. <laughs> hey, this Bible is dope, y'all. This is show you how mightable people we were, man. We getting back to it, y'all. We getting back there. In verse two, and it came to pass in an evening tide the day, uh, that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Hey, so y'all know King Day, this probably wasn't just no one time thing. King Day was probably knew what time, you know how Jake do, especially, uh, you know how the brothers do. You know, they probably, he probably was just out there. He knew what time, like at nine o'clock, 9 a.m., she gonna be outside watching herself, bathing herself. So over a process of time, he was probably watching her, constantly watching her. Like here it is, she just loading herself with the uh, with the towel and with the soap, and just watching how the suds just roll down her back. King David started to get infatuated with her, like I it said, it's, <laughs> and watching herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So David was probably just constantly looking at this woman, right? All right. In verse three, and David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is not this Beersheba, the daughter of Elon, the wife of Uriah? That was a warning from the Lord. That was a warning from the Lord <laughs> that was just presented unto David. Because scripture always says that the Lord gives us a way out, right? But what did David do? Let's read, let's read, let's read. Let's see what David did. And David sent messengers and took her. Hey, even after that, even after that, <clears throat> even after that, even after that warning, they was like, hey, man, I got to have it. I got to get this one, man. She's so bad, man. You just don't know what I be seeing in the morning, y'all. Y'all don't know what I be seeing. I got to have her. <laughs> and it says, and David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him. And he laid with her. For she was purified from uncleanness. And she returned unto her house. Hey, so he got the wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. He got the wham, bam, thank you, man. He slept with her, and then when she was cleansed again, then she went back to the house to her husband. This shows you how wicked she was. This shows you she was a wicked-ass woman, too, at this particular time. Because she consented to, uh, to lay down with David. All right? Verse 5. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, See me, Uriah. The Hittite and Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. So here it is. He lining Uriah up right now. He lining Uriah up right now. He's trying to see how good is he in battle? How are the battles? Because they always kept a report of how the battles were going, right? Uh, verse eight. And David said unto Uriah, go down to the house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the house, uh, the king's house. And there followed him a, uh, a mess of meat from the king. So here it is, Uriah, or the king David was trying to set Uriah up to go down and sleep with his wife. 
And it says, but Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord and went not down to his house. So, hey, Uriah, like, no, nah, man, I ain't going down there with her, man. I'm trying to ride with you, King David. Shoot her in a ride. You know what I'm saying? Y'all remember Shadis, you had, um, dang, what was that dude name? The dude who's always down to ride. I forgot his name. Uh, nah, <laughs> I'll think about it later. <laughs> but, hey, Uriah was a rider, though, y'all. Uriah was uh, a loyal man. That's what we need in Israel. We need loyal men. We need loyal men to be in this truth. Oh, uh, verse 10. And when they had told David, saying Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Can thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thy house? So why you didn't go, Uriah? I just told you to go. And Uriah said unto David, The ark in Israel of Judah abide in the tents. And my lord Joab, the servants my lord, and in uh, the camp, the fields shall shall I then go to drink and lie with my wife. Hey, I got work to do. You got brothers right now. All they want to do is go lay up and be under their wives. Lay up and be under their wives. They ain't taking no, they ain't going over no uh, blitzes. They ain't going nowhere. <laughs> they ain't going on no blitzes. They ain't going on no quests. But hey, yeah, hey, they wife tell them, hey, let's go on a vacation. Let's go on a vacation to Florida. Well, let's go on a vacation here or there. Hey, they ready to go. <laughs> but when it comes to the work of the Lord, oh, no, nah, I can't go to camp tonight. Uh, I can't come to camp in the morning. Oh, uh, like, you can have multitude of different reasons, but we know what, we know the reasons why. We know the reason why you don't want to go to war because you want to lay in front of your wife. The Lord says, don't roll like that. Like, yes, you gotta, you gotta make time for your wife, but hey, the Lord comes first, y'all. The Lord comes first. All right. Shall I then go in my house and to eat and to drink and lie with my wife as thou livest, as thy soul liveth? I will not do this thing. You know, Uriah's like, hey, I'm not doing that. And David said to Uriah, tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee part. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he eat and drank before him. He made drunk. And at eve he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord. So, hey, King David is trickling down right now, y'all. David is spiraling out of control. He done laid with a man's wife. Now he's trying to uh, get him drunk. So he finally got his own brother drunk. And then it says, but went not down to his house. So he still didn't go. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent by the hand of Uriah. He wrote in the letter. So here it is. David is sending a letter to Uriah now, right? He's sending it by Joab. So Joab is like a mailman right now, right? And it says, he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him that he may be bitter and die. Hey, so Joab is getting this letter, right? Joab is getting this letter. In no time do we read about Joab is saying to David, hey, man, you, hey, you won't kill this man? Joab is in sin right now, too, because he knows about it. Leviticus 5 and 1. If you see someone sinning, hey, you better talk up. You better speak up. <laughs> but no, Joab didn't roll like that. Joab has some wicked ways as well, too. Uh, verse, let me see here. Verse 7 or 17. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And Uriah the Hittite died. So here it is. King David set Uriah up to die. He got him drunk. Still didn't go home. And then he set him up to die. He set him up to die. That's like um, that's like today's time. How we have the Jack boys. Here it is. You know what time What time? Um, people be going to the hot spot. The hot spot might, might be at McDonald's or it might be at Burger King or it might be at a, the kick uh, the kicking the spot. And here it is. You send Hitman out to go kill him. Kill that person. The Lord says, hey, we're not supposed to uh, avenge or bear any grudge or any hatred towards our people. David is really drifting off right now, y'all. Um, let me see. Verse 19. And charge the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, and if so be that the king's wrath arise, he say unto thee, Wherefore, approach ye tonight the city, uh, to ye did fight. Know ye not? Let me see, I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump. Uh, verse 22. 
So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him, sent for him. And the uh, messenger said, David, surely the men prevail against us and came unto the field where we are upon even unto the, uh, the entering of the gate. Um, let me see. It's a certain part I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find. Um, okay, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump. Verse 27. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her in his house and became his wife. So now he just took the wife, right? And bared him a son. But that thing that David had done displeased the Lord. All right, so this is what it gets real good, y'all. It gets real good in chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There went two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, and the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which had uh, had bought and nourished up, and uh, and it grew up together with him and with his children, and did eat as his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. So the Lord is saying our wives are like our daughter. Outside of the sexual uh, content, our wives are like our daughters because we got to nourish them. We got to we gotta provide for them. We got to provide a roof over their head. We got to provide clothes on their back. Our wives are like daughters to us, right? Uh, verse 4, and there came a traveler unto the rich man and spared to take uh, take of his flock. And his own herd and dressed in a wayfaring man, and but the, took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled, and against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he had did this thing, and because uh, he no pity. And Nathan said to David. Thou art the man that saith to the Lord God of Israel, I anoint thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I greatly uh, gave thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave the house of Israel and Judah, and that it had been too little. I would have more over have given unto unto thee, and such and such things. Wherefore, has I despised the commandments of the Lord to do evil in his sight? And then uh, thou killed the, uh, Uriah the Hittite with the sword. Let me see here. Let me jump down to the part. Um, thus said the Lord, uh, behold the evil. I will take the wise. Let me see here. I'm trying to get where. Let me see here. Um, I should have already had it written down, y'all. My bad, my bad. Um, and Nathan departed into his house and the Lord struck the child Uriah's wife unto David and it was very sick. Um, before uh, thou besought God of the children, David fasted and went in and lay in all night unto the earth. So my point is, my point is, my point is, I was trying to find a scripture, but the point is when we get corrected in this truth, King David is the perfect example. Just take it. Just take it. A lot of times we like to hear correction and we like to point fingers at everybody else. Oh, he didn't do this for me or she didn't do that or he didn't do this or what about him? He's doing this or she's doing that. You always point the finger. Whenever the Lord is identifying something within you, you need to check it. You need to check yourself, not check everybody else that's around you. The Lord is identifying something in you for you to change, right? Because at the end of the day, we all have to give account for our own souls, right? Matter of fact, let's get there real quick. Uh, the pointing of the finger, Isaiah 58. The Lord hates that thing. The Lord could have pointed the finger at Joab. The Lord could have pointed, I mean, David could have uh, pointed the finger at Joab. He could have pointed, you know, most of the people probably seen what King David was doing. But King David not once pointed the finger at nobody else but himself. Like King David was like, hey, I'm the one who is lusting after this woman. I'm the one who slept with this man's wife. I'm the one who killed this man. I'm the one who bared a, uh, married this woman and bared a son by her. It was all me. I'm not blaming the people who could have checked me. I'm not blaming the people who was around me at these particular times. I'm not the one blaming Joab for what he did. Now, of course, they're going to have to give a count for what they've done. 
But whenever correction has come, take it. Take it. Don't point the finger. The Lord hates that thing. And I'm going to show y'all real quick. Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. Um, let me see here. Put away the point of a finger. Uh, Isaiah 58. Okay, yeah. Isaiah 58 and verse 9. And it says, Then shall I call, and the Lord shall answer. Shall I cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If I would take away the mist of the yoke, meaning take away the bondage of y'all of our people, constantly trying to uh, put our people in bondage. That's what the yoke is, putting our people in bondage. And the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity, meaning you always point the finger at somebody else for what they've done. You always point the finger at somebody else for what they're not doing. But opposed to taking accountability of what you've done, it was you, David, who chose to lay down with that woman. It was you, David, who chose to kill Uriah. Not everybody. You can't blame everybody else for what they've done. Because you got to take account of, hold accountability for yourself. You got to hold yourself accountable. Right? Let me see here. Um, let me see here. So a simple mind is going to react in a certain particular way to where they're going to be pointing the finger at everybody else but some, and not holding themselves accountable. They're going to be pointing the finger at everybody else but not taking accountability for what they've done. But a righteous man is going to take accountability and examine himself and repent from those wicked deeds that he's done. Just like King David did. King David, life was hell after that. But King David took it. King David understood it was judgment from the Lord. King David understood he could have been killed. Hell, it was probably times that King David probably wished he was killed. You think about it. Here it is. Uh, one of your sons is raping your wife on top of a building. Here it is. One of your sons trying to kill you. Here it is, you got uh, Saul's, uh, King Saul's old homies talking stuff against you, talking down on your name. Here it is, you got people trying to build up coups against you. King David was like, man, that's a lot, man. But it, at the end of the day, King David always took accountability of what he did. He knew it was all on him. He didn't point the finger at nobody else. He took the correction. That's what we have to do, y'all. We got to learn how to take the correction. Take the correction. All right? So here's some ways we change as a people, right? We have to learn the Bible. We have to learn the Bible, y'all. We got to learn the Bible. Second Timothy's, I think I pulled this last class though. Uh, Second Timothy's chapter two. Second Timothy's chapter two and verse 15. Because the way we become lively stones, the way we become a, a living body is by studying the scriptures and knowing, uh, knowing what, what errors we got to, we got to use this Bible as a mirror to identify the things, the imperfections that we deal with, right? And the only way we can do that is by studying. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We have to constantly study. That's why we always talk about the four chapters a day. That's why we always talk about the 15 minutes with the captains, the daily breads, uh, the old Sabbath classes, like a lot of them, the, the truth shall make you free series. Those things are how we study. Those things are how we build ourselves up to be what God expects us to be. We can put that mirror up against us and be like, okay, you got this imperfection here, you got the imperfection there. Okay, let me see how I can work on this imperfection right here. Oh, I need to know, I need to pick out my beard. You know what I'm saying? I need to groom my, uh, groom my afro. You know, I need to, to pat it down a little bit. It shows the imperfections in you so you can fix it. So you can be that perfect image of God, that perfect image of what the Lord wants us to be. All right, from there, uh, 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 7. Let me get there real quick. 2 Chronicles. See here. Seven second rule, y'all. <laughs> uh, 2 Chronicles chapter seven, oh, 15 and verse 7. It says, Be ye strong, therefore, and let your not your hands be weak. Meaning, don't get weak in this truth. Like, meaning, like, don't forsake the truth. There's going to be times we're going to be in a lower state. There's going to be times where we go through troubles. But don't let your hands get weak to where you just stop, uh, drop the plow. You got to be able to continue on plowing. Continue on. It might be hot outside. You imagine uh, a person plowing the ground. There's going to be times of where the weather ain't, ain't as all, um, where the clouds ain't always out. <laughs> you might be plowing in 110 degree weather. 
but you got to keep on doing. You might not go as fast as you used to or when it, when the sun was behind the cloud, <laughs> but hey, you got to keep on going. You got to keep on pushing. Like, yes, you might have marital troubles. Yes, you're going to have congregational troubles. Yes, you're going to have personal uh, troubles, but they don't let your hand get weak to where you drop the plow. Don't let your hand get weak to where you put the Bible to the side and you go into all midst of uh, wickedness, midst of wickedness. We have to be able to continue on fighting in this truth, y'all. We have to stay fighting. We have to stay fighting. And it says, for your work will be rewarded. Your work will be rewarded when you fix it. When you apply Matthew 18 with your brother and with your sister and this truth, you'll be rewarded for that thing. You'll be rewarded for when you apply First uh, Thessalonians when it says uh, you, um, a man must go out and work. You'll be rewarded for that. You'll be rewarded for it when you sisters, when you treat your husband as a king and a God on this earth, you'll be rewarded for that. You'll be rewarded, sisters, for when you teach your children uh, the laws of God. You'll be rewarded, man, when you go out here in these streets and you teach your people. The Lord says you're going to be rewarded for that. And that's the ultimate goal. We all want to be rewarded for our works. But we can't get rewarded or we don't want the reward that we get or the reward that a person that gets weak and drops the plow you don't want that reward. <laughs> that reward is something we don't want to even know about. You know what I'm saying? Like have no imagination of. <laughs> you know, because that reward is something crazy right there. But we got to continue on fighting, y'all. We got to continue on fighting. Got to continue on fighting. From there, uh, Titus 3 and 8. Titus 3 and 8, y'all. Titus 3 and 8. We got to be able to believe. Okay, we got to be able to study. We got to be able to believe. We got to believe what we study. We got to believe it. Titus 3 and 8. It says, this is the faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm consistently that thou which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable for profitable unto men. It's a profitable thing when we believe in the Lord. It's a profitable thing when we put our faith and trust in the Lord, put our faith and trust in his Bible. Because yes, it's going to be hard. You might be working a nine to five right now. And, you know, you got to clock in and, you know, Esau will be on your tail. But, you know, hey, all praise to the most high. At least you got the Sabbath day off. You got the Sabbath day off. You able to get the high holy days off. But, you know, you got to keep on fighting because, like, yes, Esau might be in your constant in your ear. Or you might have a, a lion in the house. Or you might have a, a dragon in the house. You know, sometimes we got to endure those trials. We got to endure those trials and keep and believe in the Lord that he will redeem us. We, I've seen a lot of horrific stuff in this truth. And the people who always endure are the ones who have great faith and belief in what they read. In. We have to be able to believe in these things. I've seen a lot of crazy stuff. And all praise to the most high. The ones who truly believe are the ones who are going to keep on enduring. Here's a perfect example. A perfect example of that is if you go through a whole week, a whole week, of working hard, right? You're going through a whole week of working hard, but you believe you're going to get that check on Friday, you're going to keep on working. You're going to keep on working because you're looking for that check. You're looking for that reward. You believe you're going to get a reward. You might not have gotten that reward on Monday or on Tuesday or on Wednesday or on Thursday or on Friday hit. Hey, once you get out of work at 3 o'clock, 3, 4 o'clock, you get that nice check. Hey, you're going to go cash that junk, put it in the bank or do whatever you want to do with it. Hey, that's a perfect example of belief right there because it didn't, it wasn't given to you at that particular time or you was uh, hustling and bustling, but hey, your reward came at the end, right? And that's what Paul knew. That's what Christ knew. They all believed in these words because why? These words have time and time again come out to be true. Deuteronomy 28, Joel 3, all these things have always came into fruition at some particular time. And we got to constantly believe that we know that our Lord and Savior will come back and redeem us. We'll come back and redeem us, y'all. Uh, from there, from there, from there, from there. Okay, so we have to study the Bible. We have to believe the Bible. We also got to watch our surroundings. We must watch our surroundings. We must, 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 must watch our surroundings. We must watch our sur surroundings. Uh, Sirach chapter 15. Sirach chapter 15. Sirach chapter 15 and verse. I'm going to start at. Uh, I'm sorry. Sirach chapter 13. I'm sorry. Sirach chapter 13 and verse 15. It says, Every beast loveth his like, 
and every man loveth his neighbor. Right? Verse 16. All flesh consorted according to, to kind, and man will cleave to his life. You see lions hanging with lions. You see bears hanging with bears. You see elephants hanging with elephants. You see, uh, <laughs> you see hyenas hanging with hyenas. <laughs> you don't see, you don't see no mixing, right? So it says, a man will cleave to his life. Sometimes you got to ask yourself, why am I always with a sister who's always in trouble? Every time I look around, this sister, she getting stood up. This sister, her name is out there. Or this brother, he's getting stood up. His name is always out there. Why am I always around this person? You got to ask yourself these things. Why am I always around the people who's always getting in trouble? Or, or on the flip side, all praise to the most high. Why am I always around the people who are doing great works? The people who are constantly putting in the bricks, constantly being seen, constantly doing what's righteous, constantly taking care of their kids, taking care of their wives, constantly out in the streets teaching their people to repent. Why, like, you know what I'm saying? You gotta ask yourself, am I around people who are constantly moving forward or am I around people who are constantly digressing? You have to ask yourself that. You have to ask yourself that. And when you ask yourself that, okay, it's either, okay, I'll praise the most. I'm around righteous men and women who are constantly moving, constantly moving and pushing forward. Or, or I'm around people who are digressing, people who are always being busybodies, murmuring, backbiting, uh, causing strife amongst people, telling everybody business. Hey, this woman right here, this man right here know the business of everybody. And she out here telling everybody, but I'm always around her. Why is that? Maybe you like that. Maybe you like hearing that murmuring. Maybe you like hearing that backbiting. But hey, you better repent of that. You better repent of that. You better repent of that thing. All right. Verse 17. What fellowship have the wolf with the lamb? So the sinner with the godly. Meaning you're going to be like, meaning those two people can't be around each other. A wolf and a lamb ain't going to be around each other. A lamb, no, hey, if I'm around this wolf, he's going to try to eat me. And the wolf know, hey, if I come around this land, I'm gonna eat him. And it says, so, so the, uh, sorry, so the sinner with the godly. So the sinner with the godly. That's heavy right there. If you're a godly man, if you're a godly woman, you're not gonna be constantly be around a sinner. If you're a sinner, you don't wanna be around a godly person. I don't wanna hear nothing about that Bible. I don't wanna hear nothing about, um, if I lay down with a woman, I gotta marry her. Now I'm trying to go to club work. They twerk that right now. <laughs> You got to think about it. these two people cannot consort together. They cannot be alone. With, uh, they cannot be together for long. That's why sometimes you think about it. When we at our workplace and you think about it, you go on lunch, right? You go on lunch and then uh, you so you're in the lunchroom, right? And you hear all the guys talking about sports. They talking about females. They talking about everything outside of the laws of God. I'm like, man, I can't wait to go. I need, I need to go back to work now. You know what I'm saying? I need to go ahead and clock back in right now get off my break because I don't want to hear these things. I don't want to be in the midst of these conversations. That's what a godly man is going to do. A godly man ain't going to want to talk about uh, Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi B and all these uh, women who put themselves out there. Women ain't going to want to be around other women who's always talking about um, uh, men's shoe size and how tall he is and how fit he is. No, a righteous woman's going to be like, no, nah, this beats me with that conversation. You can have that. A righteous person ain't going to want to be around someone who's always murmuring, who's always backbiting, who's always in the midst of everybody's business. This woman could tell you, like I said before, this woman could tell you what's going on in each and every sister's household. This woman right here could tell you what's going on in everybody's marriages because she's always ear hustling. She's always looking for the latest news. Like she's always in somebody's business. But a godly person ain't going to want to be around it. They're like, hey, matter of fact, a godly person going to check that sister, especially if they ain't the truth. If they keep in the laws of God, they're going to check that sister. Or they're going to check that brother. All right? And it says, what agreement is there between the hyena and a dog? And what peace between the rich and the poor? In verse 19, and it says, as, as the wild ass is, I'm sorry, as the wild ass is the lion's prey in the wilderness. So the rich eat up the poor. 
These two don't go together because the rich is going to get richer and the poor going to get poor. The, the, the wild ass, it says, as the wild ass is the lion's prey in the wilderness. The lion trying to eat the, uh, the ass, wild ass. These two things don't go together. <laughs> That's why he said you got to be separate. Like the scripture says, it was at first Corinthians, I believe, got to be separate. So, all right, you got to study the Bible, believe the Bible, watch your surroundings. Uh, the next thing is um, the surrounding yourself and evaluate what isn't working in those habits, in your old habits, right? You got to evaluate yourself, meaning examine yourself, see what the things that you've been doing that hasn't been working for you in the past, right? And a part of that is examining yourself, examining yourself. Examining yourself. All right. Second Corinthians chapter 13. Second Corinthians chapter 13 and verse five. <coughs> Excuse me, y'all. Say, so examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Prove, <coughs> prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. So you got to know yourself better than anybody else. You got to be able to understand and read the scriptures and see what are you applying and what are you not applying. The scripture says, hey, thou shalt not commit adultery. Hey, they don't need to put that phone down. Because I know if I lust upon a woman, I've already committed fornication with her. Or <clears throat> maybe it's um, maybe it could be uh, alcohol for some brothers and sisters. Well, if you know, if you're alcohol, you need, I need to put that bottle down. <laughs> Hey, if you know that you deal with a lying spirit, hey, maybe you need to stop talking to that particular person whenever you want to start lying. If you know that you deal with a murmuring spirit or when you get around a certain particular sister, maybe I shouldn't be around that sister because she's always murmuring. Maybe it could be um, maybe it could be an envious spirit. If you know you're dealing with envy, then hey, send a prayer to the Lord. Send a prayer to the Lord. Hey, Lord, like... Like, allow me to have an understanding that what this man has or what this woman has isn't meant for me. Sometimes, hey, a lot of times we got to confess unto the Lord the things that we're dealing with. That's another thing, too. Matter of fact, James 5 and 16. James 5 and 16. We got to confess unto the Lord the things that we deal with as well. Uh, confess unto the Lord and confess your faults one to another. Uh, James 5 and 16. It says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. That ye may be healed with the affectional fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We gotta be able to be able to confess these things we deal with. Some things we deal with is gonna be embarrassing as all get out. But do you fear man more than you fear the Lord? Because when you're in the midst of a righteous congregation, that righteous man that you confess to, or that righteous woman you confess to, they should be able to help and build you up with the scriptures. Like, yes, you might deal with homosexuality, but you basically should be able to confess that thing and ask for. Uh, help with it, like maybe it ain't the best thing for you to. Um, uh, what's, I'm trying to look at thing right now. I can't think of one right now. But hey, we got to be able to confess our faults, y'all. Regardless of how bad, it, how bad it might might make might make us look, or how bad we might think we look, we still have to be able to confess it, y'all. We have to be able to confess that thing. Another thing too is being able to have righteous conversations. All right, um, First Corinthians, um, what is it? First Corinthians, uh, thirteen. Is it thirteen? Uh, evil communications. Oh, I used to know it. I used to know it. <laughs> I should have had it written down. Um, let me see here. What is that? Um, let me see here. Hold on. I know. I know what to do. Evil communications. We got to be able to cut off evil communications. Have to be able to cut off evil communications. There it is. Uh, first, uh, first Corinthians fifteen and thirty-three. It says, "Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good men." And that's not only in, a, in the midst of us communicating and talking to each other, but it also goes to social media when it comes to the TikToks, the uh, the um, the Facebooks, when it comes to the Twitters, when it comes to Snapchat. All these things could be evil communications that can uh, pollute our mind. Pollute our mind because they say you are what you eat, you are what you watch, you are what you talk about. If you're talk, constantly talking about these scriptures, then hey, the scriptures going to flow through you. But if you're constantly talking about Atlanta Housewives, then dang you're going to start acting like Atlanta Housewives. If you talk about NBA Young Boy or Young Thug, you're going to start acting like NBA and Young Thug. 
These things constantly corrupt our minds, right? We got to constantly feed our minds the righteous spiritual food according to what God has given us, all right? So, hey, all praise to the Most High God. Hey, it's been another uh, daily bread. I hope pray y'all glean something from this today. I hope pray y'all stay in the spirit. Y'all have a great Monday. I love every last one of y'all. Y'all stay in the spirit. Hey, with that, y'all, we're going to say shalom. Most high in Christ bless y'all. Shalom.